You're watching The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ MV Angela Yee, Charlemagne the God. We are The Breakfast Club, and we have a special. That's right. <laughs> special. That's right. Guest on The Breakfast Club this morning. The, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has returned That's to The right. Breakfast Club. How are you, young man? <laughs> <laughs> when you started it off good, the old man is doing fine. <laughs> Very glad to be here with you. Yes, sir. I came really to express my gratitude to you and to DJ and to Angela for the privilege of being on the Breakfast Club that really helped the minister to reach the young people mm -hmm. that made 10, 10, 15 successful. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want you to come to where I was. I wanted to come and be with you where you are most comfortable to say thank you. It was an honor to, to have you. you. Honor to have you. The last time you came, we, we were talking about the march. We were gearing up for the march. Now the march happened. What, what do you think about the march and, and the turnout? And Well, the, the turnout was great. Mm -hmm considering <clears throat> that we had no mainstream media helping us, but the media that really helped us was social media. Mm -hmm. And stations like yours, and, and the talk began to get so great, and the young people showed up in great numbers at 10, 10, 15, and the movement that began is now jumping. We asked for 10,000 fearless, and 8,000 or more have signed up. Wow. That want to come into the hood and present our bodies to stand between the guns and the gangs, and let's see if we can resolve some of the conflict, create employment for our young people, mm -hmm. and then take control of where we live. That's our aim, and we pray that God will bless us to do just that. Now, you mentioned media didn't support. Did it bother you that networks like BET didn't support? It's black entertainment television. <clears throat> but it's black owned by white. Mm -hmm. And when BET was owned by Mr. Johnson, we would not have had a successful Million Man March if it were not for Mr. Johnson. Bev Smith, a great, great um, uh, communicator, allowed us to announce the Million Man March on their show and the support that Mr. Johnson gave us financially his influence, and on the days before the march, he took out a full-page ad in the USA Today supporting everything that we were attempting to do for the Day of Atonement and bringing black men together as never before. Absolutely. Let's talk about some current events, Brother Minister, because uh, people are under the impression that you endorsed Donald Trump for president. <laughs> <laughs> I saw some good in Trump in this sense, that when a man refuses to take money from those who give money to politicians and you don't uh, pay the piper and sit back and let somebody else call the tune, so I thought that Mr. Trump, by saying, going right to members of the Jewish community and telling them, I don't need your money and I don't want your money, that meant to me that he would be free enough to work for the good of America. And I applauded him for that, but of course, things change. Yeah. And uh, he's looking for some money now and... To, uh, he's looking for a billion dollars, and he doesn't want to put that up, so he's looking to some of those who traditionally support politicians to have their way. And then I was on radio in Chicago, and I 
I was talking about Mr. Trump and certain things that he was saying that he wanted to go into Iraq and just take the oil. And I said, he, he sounded like the Corleone family. You know, let's get it all while we got the muscle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I said, this man is peeling back the onion of white civility. And every level of that onion that he peels back, more and more of the nakedness of rancor and hate and bitterness is coming up out of the followers. So this is one of the most interesting of all of the um, political uh, presidential runs that I've had the blessing of seeing in my 83 years on this planet. Now I've seen Bernie Sanders said it's like choosing between the lesser of two evils. You're not a fan of Hillary Clinton either. So if it turns out to be Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, what do you think we need to do? Mm. You need to pray. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Look, Donald Trump is who he is. And that's one thing that politicians are not. It's all game playing. But with Mr. Trump, what you see is just what you get. He's not trying to be politically correct. He doesn't care. And when they say he's he's not presidential, I ask myself, what does it mean to be presidential? You wear a suit, you talk to the American people like you possess the character and the dignity of one who seeks the highest office in the land, and behind the door, you're the worst criminal on the planet, Mm. plotting the overthrow of nations and governments and regime change and sending drones to kill people you don't like. That's presidential. Mm. So if that's the kind of person you want, vote for Hillary. Vote for Trump. And you go to hell with both of them. As far as Mr. Sanders is concerned, he's probably the most honest of all of them, but we have to be careful because this is the most important election in the history of this country because you're not just voting for a president, you're voting for the person who can take America totally down. America will never be great as she once was again, but she can survive if she does the right thing. And maybe during the broadcast, I'll tell you what that right thing is, but none of them are saying the right thing to save America. She's in deep trouble, and Hillary will take you there, Trump will take you there, and if Sanders does not get his way He's fighting against a system. He sounds good. The system is rotten to the core. That's why every time we have uh, had a presidential election, whether it's white or black, you always have to choose between the lesser of two evils. So you either vote for Satan or the devil, Mm. and you catch hell with either one. So if Mr. Sanders who has the best vocal challenge to the system, in my judgment. But is he strong enough to turn the system to do the uh, fulfill the words and the promises that he makes to all of the young people who see in Mr. Sanders tremendous hope? So I'll talk about that maybe later on in the program. Well, you know, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of brothers and sisters feel like they don't want to vote this year because they feel like the system is, is out to get them anyway. So what's the point? Well, that's the thinking of the most enlightened because the most enlightened know that the system is rotten. It's been rotten for a long time. And so can we get out of this 
system something good for us? We could if we were united with an intelligent self-interest that we could push, we might be able to get something. But um, America is out to destroy the little man. I'm talking about those in the highest places. Flint, Michigan was not an accident. That's by design. I'm on my way to Newark, New Jersey, and I just heard that some lead was coming into Newark, into schools. Water supply, right? And I asked the question, whose schools? They said the black and the brown. Is that an accident? Mm. I don't think so. We are being designed to be destroyed. And unless we see that and come together as a people under vicious attack should, then we will suffer the consequences of the evil that's in high places. And to those of you in the listening audience who are spiritually inclined, listen to these words of Paul. We war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness that's in high places. It's in high places that the plot against black and brown and poor white is going on. It's spiritual wickedness that's way up in the ruling classes of religious people who don't want to see the little man rise. It's the principalities and the powers. So unless we come together as a people and stop our foolish beefing among each other, sit down like intelligent men and women and settle the things that divide us from each other, then come together like a solid wall and we can make something happen. To answer you very specifically, the Bible says, talking about Babylon, God says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. We don't need the Democratic Party. We don't need the Republican Party. We can get a little from both of them. But Elijah Muhammad said, we ought to form our own political machine, mm. a machine that works for the oppressed. The oppressed, black, brown, red, yellow, white. So Let's she- come together and form our own party and give the other parties hell and then vet who we want and take down these crooked, rotten politicians that are in Congress, in the uh, White House, and in the uh, Supreme Court. Do you, do you feel the rhetoric that Malcolm X expressed in uh, the ballot to the bullet still stands in 2016? It may be. Mm-hmm. Brother Malcolm said it's either the ballot or bullet. What was brother saying? He's saying there's much that could be accomplished if we voted intelligently, voting our own self-interest as a people. But if we don't vote, if the ballot won't work, Malcolm said the bullet will. Well, we're coming to a point now whether we're going to have to decide whether we want to live under tyranny Or do we want to revolt against tyranny? And that means, unfortunately, we may have to shed blood to really be free. Mm. Now, for for a lot of the the young ones out there that don't know, don't know what to follow, what what would you tell them? What's the next step? What should they be doing? What should they be eyeing? Because they went to the march and, and they're excited. Now, what's next for them? Who could argue with us for trying to make our own community a decent place to live? 
You know, we really are being colonized. Harlem and Brooklyn, they used to be or are colonies. In a colony, the uh, education is controlled from outside. The politics is controlled from outside. The economics is controlled from outside. The police in a colony are not there to serve and to protect, but there to keep the colonized ones from disturbing the status quo. The question is, do we want to continue to live as a colony or do we want to be like the original 13 colonies and decide that we've had enough? Let's break from a colonial past and let's seek freedom. That means what? How do we do it? What do we do now? Where shall we go now? It's our responsibility to make where we live decent and clean. It's our responsibility to protect and police our own communities. We do not need racist police policing us, killing us as they please. Why not we police ourselves? Why couldn't those black officers who are trained, soldiers who are trained, young people who are militant but without direction. Why can't we train our young people? And instead of the money going to a system that oppresses us, some of those tax dollars that we give to police, give them to us and let us police ourselves. Let's take control of the schools. You can't make a decent people with an education rooted in white supremacy. We've got to understand that this is not a system that will make us clean and decent and upright and strong and self-determined people. We have to set up education for all those in the colonies. And after a while, you'll have a decent people coming up. You'll have protection for your women and girls. No pimping, no hustling like that going on when we can produce jobs for our young people, institutions that serve us as a people. I'll close that by saying this. Look, Chinatown right here in New York, they're separate in an American equation. They don't feel like they're suffering because they control what goes on in their part of the town. They're the business people. You can't say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm going to set up a business in Chinatown and I'm going to sell shrimp fried rice and egg foo young. Not there. They will tell you quick. Not here. Go up in Harlem or go up where you live in Brooklyn and you set up your shop. But you don't own the businesses in your own community. Everybody, all the immigrants that come to America, do you know where they find the American dream? By setting up businesses in the black community, providing us with our necessities, which we should be able to provide for ourselves. The Koreans have 90,000 stores in black communities across the country. What are they selling us? They're selling us a little hair. They're doing our nails. And the money that they make from us, go and see their part of town. Koreatown is beautiful. Chinatown is beautiful. Greektown is beautiful. The Jewish part of town is beautiful. But where we live, that's where the garbage dumps is. That's where the whoring is going on. That's where the pimping, the drugs, and the guns, and the gangs are going on. So that's where we live. So who in America would stand up and tell us we don't have a right to clean up where we live and make it right for our people? We got that right, and we have to exercise that right and fight like hell against anyone who would tell us we can't make our own community a decent and safe place to live for our women and girls, our elderly and our young. That's not the city's responsibility. 
that is ours, but the money that we pay in taxes. It should come back to us. We're going to build our community. We're going to educate our people. We are scholars. We are not fools. We can set up an educational system and curriculum that will take our children from the kindergarten to college and make them scientists and scholars in every field of human endeavor. That's our job, brothers and sisters, and we can't keep giving it to somebody else, and when they mess it up, we want to protest. Protest our ignorance in not taking responsibility for what we bring into this world. Well, how do we retrain our people to succeed instead of being trained to just serve? Because you know, a lot of people would say that, you know, it's easier for an immigrant to get a loan than to be an African-American or minority and get a loan. Yes, and that's a fact. The Koreans that make their money in our community, if we had a black bank, you'll find they don't deposit anything of what they take from us into a black bank that would serve our community. They set up a bank in their own community. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, my teacher, called people like this blood suckers of the poor. You got them black like that who don't give a damn. All they want is to make a dollar and run. Run where? To another community, but not build the community in which we live. So, yes, brother, it's difficult to get a loan, but not for them, because they go to their own bank, which they put their money in that they take from us. Imagine, Charlemagne, $1.1 trillion comes through our hands this year. That's <laughs> that makes us the ninth richest country in the world. Mm. And those that have less than $1.1 trillion, they're building schools, hospitals, farms, factories. They're doing something for themselves as a nation. Here we are, nearly 50 million people. And we are here begging somebody else, can I have a job? Uh, do you have something for me to do? Can you feed me? Will you educate me? This is the crime, the ignorance of black people. We have to erase the ignorance and get us started doing something for ourselves. And don't blame others if they don't want to give you money. Do you know that immigrants that come here that are Chinese, is a Chinese community that puts money aside. When their Chinese brother comes in the, commu uh, in the country, they here, take this, go in the black community, set up a business. Look at the number of Arabs that are now in the black community. Look at the number of Indians from the subcontinent of India owning um, many businesses inside the black community, the hotels, the motels where we go for a party night with our girlfriend or somebody else's wife. All of that is done in our community, but the money goes back to their communities. If we, and who, look, nobody can fault us for wanting to take the money that comes in our hands and keeping it in our community. The money that comes in within six hours, DJ, it's gone. The money that stays in the community the longest are the Asians. Their money, when they make money, it circulates at least 30 days before it leaves their community. That means that that money is enriching their people through sales of service and needs of their community. Jewish people are next, and blacks and Hispanics are at the bottom. The Hispanics are better than we are because they have unity and self-love. Six of them will come and get an apartment and Next thing you know, two more family members will come. Then they'll own the house 
that they're living in. Then they start moving east and west or north and south on the block and owning more property, pooling their resources, bringing from their, from Mexico businesses, food and the Mexican things that Mexicans love. You can't fault them for that. They're hardworking people, and that's our brown brother. We're back behind all of them, and we've been here longer, have more education, and have done less with it. And but it's our time. And I do think it's important for us to team up together and start things like investment groups to give back. Like Envy and I, we teamed up and we're actually opening a juice bar in Brooklyn in Bed-Stuy because we thought it would be something that's beneficial for the neighborhood. Now, that's wisdom. And using our own money, no loans from the bank, just all of us team up together, put our money together. And look at what she said. All of us team up. Individuals, that's dead unless you got a lot of money. But if you get eight or ten of us with the same thought in mind, we pool our money, open up something in our own community that serves a need of our community. Our people today want to spend their money with their own, even if it costs a little more, we would rather spend it with our own. May I just say this, brother? You know, at the, at the march and before uh, 10, 10, 15, we said we were going to boycott Christmas. I haven't been on this show since, but we boycotted Christmas. We told our people, no, it's up with Jesus and it's down with Santa. Send the white boy that you lie telling your children that he's going <laughs> to drop something down a chimney that don't even exist when you live in an apartment building. And then you go and spend all your money downtown but now, after they take your money, you don't get the respect of even building the American economy. So this year, they listened to us. And above all, God heard us and made the weather so warm till all the things that they bought for winter sales is in the factory now or in the warehouse now because they weren't selling. So here's what I learned. Several Walmarts, about 200 or more Walmarts closed down. 40 Macy's closed down. Best Buy, all of the big ones, they suffered. Now, why did they suffer? Because we decided we're going to squeeze our money. We can't fight you with guns. We don't have no guns. And the guns that we have, we don't know how to shoot. So we end up shooting and killing ourselves. But that dollar that you got in your pocket, boy, squeeze that dollar and find a way to pool that dollar like Angela and DJ are doing, opening up a juice bar, not a whiskey bar but a juice bar where we can go and get a healthy drink to keep us alive in a better health another day. We can all do that and then put out of the community those that are bloodsuckers of the poor. What are you bringing in here? Look at the food. You go to the corner store, it's the black community is a food desert. We don't have decent food and that's what's killing us. So we, who among us is strong enough to say, what's in that truck? What are you bringing in our community? I guarantee you, you can't bring no truck in the Greek community, the Italian community, the Polish community, the Jewish community. You can't do that. They want to know what are you bringing in my community. And if I see it's good for my community, come in. That's the way intelligent people do. You don't let people in your house if you don't know who they are. They knock on the door. Yeah, who is it? What do you want? Well, people just come in to the black community. There is no structure here like a real community. But it's going to get different now because we are waking up, man, and we're going to ask people what you got in that truck. We don't like the way you treat our people. So we're telling you this is your last month 
on this or we shut you down. Why can't you do that? Why can't we shut down people who are sucking the lifeblood out of us and not giving nothing back in return? Why can't we do that? They're scared. They don't have no power. Oh, but we got power. Mm -hmm. The power is in our unity. We don't have power individually, but we have power. All we have to do is think about it, plan. I sat down a couple of weeks ago. I don't want to talk too much about it yet. But with black people on the police force, military people, those who have access to the level of intelligence of our people in the various colleges and universities, and we talked about controlling our community. You've got intelligent former police chiefs, generals that want to help train our young people to police ourselves. Look at all the abandoned buildings in our communities, just laying there, rottening. The drug dealer will go in and get high and snatch our young girls, go in and have sex and send them out. Who cares? If we don't care, who cares? Mm. We do care. And we've got to care more. We got the power. All we need is leadership and organization and a station like you and others that are in media. Let's come together. And literally, we can wake our people up I, I heard overnight. You, I've heard you speak about a, 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 establishing a new economic order for our people. Like, what, what are those first steps to doing that? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said it like this. He asked us to take a nickel a day, put it together. We had, I think, maybe at the time that he um, initiated the economic development plan, there were about maybe 8 million workers. We have now double or triple that number. What's five cents? You ain't gonna lose nothing. If you drop five cents, on your child, your child would say, what's wrong with you, Ma? (laughs) I can't get nothing with five cents. Mm -hmm. So, but five cents a day, 35 cents a week, in a year is $18. If all of us did that, I mean the millions of us, in a treasury with somebody you could trust, who do black people trust enough? Beyonce. Well, yeah, I mean, they love Beyonce. And I don't know how much they trust Beyonce, but they certainly love her. And if she would accept that responsibility, she could do it. But I think black people know the minister. They may not agree with me, but they know I'm not selling them out. They know I'll never violate my oath to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to work night and day for the rise of my people. I've been at this for darn near 60 years. I'm too old now to do something different. You couldn't get me to be corrupt. That's an impossibility. So if you can trust me and I offer my life, and will take the life of those who would take the money and run or steal from us. I think there's a time that somebody got to pay a price for robbing us. Somebody has to pay a price. It's not the white man's system. We have to set up a system of jurisprudence in our own community. The Chinese got their own way of dealing with their own, you know. Mm. You don't hear nothing about it. The Jews deal with their own. 
the Greeks, the Italians, they deal with their own. We got to deal with our people. We send you to, to the political office to do something for us. You don't get a big salary, but we sent you there to work for us. Then somebody comes along and gives you a few dollars and you start working for other interests. We make an example of you. Mm. That's where it's got to be. It's coming to that. We don't have time to play with the destiny of a people who have suffered for 460 years. We're tired of it. And these young brothers, 13, 14, 15, they're the killers today. They don't play with their OGs who are the old God in the gangs. It's the young that are doing the killing. They're tired. They're fed up. So when they know what is good for them, please don't play with them because that's the end. They will take you out because they're made like that. That's the best generation we ever produce, but we got to be the leaders that offer them hope and a plan and set up an example. The first thing Elijah Muhammad said we should do with your first million dollars, he said, set up farming to feed your people. That's number one. A bank that your people trust you, they can put money in their own bank for investment. Let's start with farming first. Right now in the inner cities, they're called food deserts. And when you go to shop or your wife goes to shop, you shop in neighborhoods where you think the food is better. And you can't afford whole foods because it's more expensive, but it's organically grown food. But look at all the empty lots in the black community. What's happening with those lots in our community? Suppose we went to the mayor that we want those lots. What do we have to do to get them? What are you going to do with them? We're going to set up urban gardening. We have, we have learned how to do that. And in Chicago, we are looking at that. Um, in Newark, New Jersey, Ras Baraka is doing that. We know how to produce good quality food. That's one of the first things we should do because they're killing us through the food, through the water. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the water should be 99% pure for human consumption. The water is not that. They've got all kind of chemicals in the water right now. So a black man or a black woman you look at the sperm count of great-grandpa and look at your own sperm count. Grandpa, in any um, emission from a billion to several billion sperms at one emission. Today, they've got uh, things in the water that cut your um, sperm count and in your 30s you have to go get a pill because you can't have an erection. So now you look on TV. Uh, let's have some, uh, what did you call that? Viagra. Viagra. The Viagra yeah. is one. What's the other? Cialis. Oh, yeah, yeah. now, see that, that one. You don't have to worry. Take a pill every day. <laughs> And you won't have any problem waking a member of your family up <laughs> and keeping them up for hours. <laughs> Envy over there like, I ain't got that problem. I got five kids. You got one on the way right now. Hey, <laughs> may God bless you. But here's the thing. When you got that child coming in, you have to be careful of the vaccines that your children are getting. I was going to ask you about that. My dear brothers, there's a there's a, a documentary out, and I wish uh, somebody would write it out for me how we could put it uh, 
out in the public so they can get this documentary. There are scientists that worked for the CDC that have blown the whistle and admitted that they were a part of creating genetically specific vaccines that do damage to black boys. Mm. And that fulfills the scriptures. Pharaoh saw the children of Israel multiplying. And he said, come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply, join on to an enemy and come against us. Well, what are you going to do, Pharaoh? We're going to kill the boys and spare the female. And right now, black boys, black men are dying at unprecedented rates. And our women's population getting stronger and stronger. Well, brothers, well, sisters, I went to the graduation the other night of my first great-grandchild. Mm -hmm. He's 21 or 22. And right at the graduation, I looked, and 92% of those that graduated at the University of Illinois were female. Wow. Mm. Now, where can a black female, who are now the lawyers, the engineers, they are the ones graduating with top degrees, where will they find in a black male a, a, um, a counterpart that is equal to them? We're filling the jails. We're filling the prisons. We're filling the armed forces. But we're not filling schools. So we're ill-equipped to do anything to build our people. And that's what we would call a conspiracy that has been planned for us. Let, let me close that point with this. Oh, they just sent it to me. Yes, sir. The, um, if you can uh, get this, it's called vaxxedthemovie.com. Vaxxed, V-A-X-X-E-D, themovie.com. Get it. Look at it. And when you, if you're pregnant right now, I pray, God, that you are wise enough to protect what's growing in your womb because that is what's frightening the enemy, that babies are coming forth from the black community, the brown community, and the poor white community that have this sense of genius. The children are born. They're not laying down for weeks and then pulling their head up. The minute they come out of the womb, their head is up, they're looking around, they're perceptive as babies. And if we vaccinate them improperly, this doesn't mean that they are not good vaccines, but I asked the doctor, what's in that vial? He'll tell me it's X and Y. I said, how do you know? Have you been able to test that to tell me that what's in that is what the label says? We've got to set up in our own community our scientists and scholars that can check what is going into our people. We got the talent. It's here, but we trust our enemy. This is the same man who went to General Amherst was his name. A college is named after a murderer. He went to the native people, <clears throat> telling them that all you need is this blanket. And it'll keep you warm during the winter months. 
but the blanket was filled with smallpox. And we wrapped ourselves in the blanket and we wrapped ourselves in death. We're too trusting of our enemies. Haven't they shown us enough in 460 years that we ought to check them out and what they give us out? That's why they close trauma centers in the black community and force our children who are killing each other to go into hospitals where we're guinea pigs, man. We really got to wake up now because we are really living in the valley of the shadow of death. And it's going to take all of us being alert. And that's one thing I find about the Breakfast Club. You all are alert black men and women. You read, you study, you hear. Don't be afraid to question. I heard Miss Clinton was here at the mm -hmm. Breakfast Club. Mm -hmm. Wise move, brother. Now, you want to know what I think. You didn't ask me, but I think I did. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Clinton is probably, probably the most qualified. She's a brilliant woman. She has great experience. She could, if she would, make a good president. But Mrs. Clinton has a record that I think black folks should study. Mr. Clinton with Joe Biden, they're the ones that's the architect of that crime bill. 1994 crime bill. That put most of our young men in jail. They didn't want to stop crime. They wanted, like Nixon said, he wanted to develop something that would crush black people, but it had to look like it was favorable. It had to have a good look to it. So Mr. Nixon said, take their passion and criminalize their passion. What is your passion, man? Our passion is to get high on the weekends or every day. That's your passion, okay? How do we criminalize it? First, we're going to make it more deadly. I smoked reefers as a young boy. I mean, um, I did. I told you all that when I was here the last time. Mm -hmm. And... Getting high back then is not like getting high today. The reefer that I used to smoke cost 50 cents. Today, I don't how much does it cost? Don't you tell me. <laughs> how much a does lot. it cost? It a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it depends what kind. They got different flavors. No, I don't smoke, but it's a lot. Now, a different flavor, which means there's chemicals added to the weed itself. And once you get a hit, you find it's more difficult to stop smoking it than it was when I was smoking. So now, these things lead to hard drugs, harder drugs. It's a conspiracy of death. And I'm just hoping that our people will wake up, man. Your lifestyle is what has to change. You are your own worst enemy when you adopt a lifestyle that is not a lifestyle, but it's actually death. You hang out, you eat the wrong foods. And my dear sisters, y you have to learn how to cook. <laughs> you know, uh, when I was coming along, every girl had to study home economics. Every boy that didn't want to go to college had a school to go to to learn a trade. Right now, all the trade schools are gone. And girls don't really learn <clears throat> not just how to cook, but the science of cooking. Food is what maintains the life you have. The flesh of your body Check any green leafy thing. You see the pores 
you see the veins. Go look at a leaf, you see the same pores, the same veins. You eat a good, healthy leaf, it strengthens your life. Your blood, the stone of the earth is the bone of your body. And all of these things are maintained through nutrition. So what the enemy has done, he takes the mineral strength out of the food and then processes it and puts it in a pill so you go to a health food store. When yesterday the supermarket really had food in it that gave you energy mm -hmm. direct from the farm. Now you got food coming from South America, from California. Well, hell, if it's from California, by the time it gets to New York, what condition is it? They gas the food. They color the food. They make the food look good. But when you eat it, ask yourself, 30, 40, 50 years ago, cancer was a Caucasian disease. We didn't have that. But today we lead in every type of cancer. It's because of malnutrition. We're getting bigger, fatter, dumber. Sorry. <laughs> but that's real because we don't know what to do with what comes from the earth naturally. Wouldn't you think men and women need to know how to cook that? I think so. I never learned. Equally, uh. And that means I'm so dependent. I have to admit it. <clears throat> but yeah, men should cook because Elijah Muhammad cooked. He taught the women of the nation how to cook mm. because that's what he was taught. So yes, men should learn to cook as well. And I told my wife, you know, as I'm getting older, <laughs> I really would like to know how to do that. You know, because it would relax my mind just to get in the kitchen and cook up something because I'm learning the science of food. <laughs> <laughs> just talk to fair kind of sensei, nigga. Told him I've been on tears since the 10th grade, nigga. Got a middle finger. Hey ladies, I need to put you on to my new hair secret. Have you heard of frontal closures? If you wear weaves or extensions, then these are a must to protect your edges, your natural hair. Save your edges, right? That's right. It's a frontal where you're able to cover your hair from ear to ear. You can go from blonde to black in a matter of seconds. Now her import has Swiss lace frontal closures with custom hairlines and make your hair look flawless without the need to ruin your natural hair. Her imports has them in all their stores and you can get them on herimports.com, of course. They also have videos to show you how to use them, so check them out today. The Breakfast Club, every weekday morning. Tune in. You're watching The Breakfast Club. You said some things about women, obviously, throughout the course of your 60 years of us studying you. And one of those things is about how women dress and how we present ourselves and being virtuous and not being stripped down and not distracting men. But some women would say, well, listen, I should be able to dress however I want to dress. It shouldn't matter what I have on. I should command that same type of respect. And that is something that's been going on. They had the slut walk that's been going on in different countries and nations. And I would love to know how, what you have to say about that today. I would say to my dear sisters, look, I, I'm in love with you. I love you like I love life itself. I respect and honor you because that's the way I've been taught and trained. But my dear sisters, you have to learn how to respect yourself. These things that make you attractive to men, they're called in the Quran your adornments. Your breast adorns your body. The beauty of your hair is an adornment. Men don't freak out over our hair unless, you know, we're a little strange, but <laughs> but, but a woman's hair 
is a thing of beauty. Your hair beautifies you. Your breast is what we all nursed from. When we came in this world, unless mother was too busy and you and I became bonded not to our mother's breast, but to a plastic bottle. Mm. Your thighs. We came <laughs> from between your thighs into this world. And somebody had to get between your thighs to produce life. You are not just a woman. You are a sacred vessel. I'm not trying to put our women on a pedestal that don't, they don't deserve to be on. No man is a man without a woman. It's a woman that helps the man to be a man. A man that don't have a woman don't know if he's one. What do I mean by that? A woman will test you to see if you are what you say you are. Mm. Any woman that you fall in love with, she love you too, but she's going to try you. That's her nature. She got to know that she can depend on you. She got to know that you stand up for her. She got to know that you back up the children that she brings in the world for us. So now... Look at the movies of Jesus. You see women around Jesus. How do they dress? What do they look like around the master? Their hair's covered. You don't see them with their breasts exposed or the ornamental effect of their hips and buttocks. You don't see that. They're covered around Jesus. Why? I mean, Mary Magdalene might have been uncovered when she met him. Mm -hmm. But after he got finished teaching her, she knew her value. Now, as a woman, yes, this is your body. You have a right to dress as you please. But, you know, you got to think, who is the teacher? and the trainer of us. We came up under our former slave masters. And look how he used to dress his woman. Go and look at the old movies. When we were slaves on the plantation, she didn't come out in no burlap. She came out dressed, and her dress covered her body. The slave was looking at her too. Miss Ann looked pretty good. After slavery was over, watch how the dress of the women changed. Watch how the length of the dress got shorter. And women used to think they were undressed if the, the dress came to the calf. Now, I've seen sisters with a dress on that is so short. When she sits, I watch them on TV. You got to sit to the side. <laughs> <laughs> Drape that leg over. I don't know how the hell they do it. but <laughs> <laughs> To cover up heaven. It is heaven. Heaven. Mm -hmm. And as a man, uh, we are the aggressive fellas. That's the way God made nature. If we are natural man, we are attracted to a woman. You are our natural partner in the act of procreation. Now there's a time and a place for everything. But when a fine-looking woman with a fine-looking form 
walks down the street, a man could be working with a jackhammer. <laughs> <laughs> and when he spies that woman, he'll watch her as she walks. Because if you don't have on something that holds, um, makes uh, the, body, the buttocks firm, you see a light basketball going. Motion. <laughs> what did I say something wrong? No. You are honest, speaking the truth. When we look at that up and down, you know, mm -hmm. it's motion, it's attracting. We look. What kind of thought comes up in your mind when that woman is that fine? Talk to me. You don't say, Oh, what a great creature. Like a dog, you may say, man, I sure would like to have some of that. Yeah. That's not what you want. But it, As, don't, it don't give us the right to disrespect them either, though. I think that's what a lot of girls are saying. They can wear what they want, and, it, and that doesn't ent entitle us to disrespect them. Well, To not be judged on the way that you're dressed either. It's okay. That's fine. But... You invite the rapist. You invite the pervert. Do you know how many men that are out of work that just stand around on the corner watching your daughters coming home from school? Today with the hormonal uh, things that they're putting in food, in the beef, in the lamb, in the chicken, in the pork. These hormones, when you eat the meat, you find a nine-year-old daughter with breasts bigger than her mother's, hips wider than her mother's, and men haven't got nothing to do but sit and watch you go and come from school, and some of them start plotting immediately. How can I get that? If you take a little time and watch forensics and see what men, sick-minded men do, and I don't know whether it's wise for women to feed the sickness that's in the man. Although I think rapists are sick-minded anyway. I see rapists um, molest and assault young children that have not developed at all, period. You know, people attack women that they're friends with, acquaintances with, that might not be dressed in any type of sexy clothing at all. Yeah, I think a rapist is going to rape you regardless of what you're wearing. I understand what you're saying, though. But yes, I mean, that's true what you're saying. But just look at what's happening today. Here are fathers taking off their daughters. Mm. Here are uncles and grandfathers and cousins and brothers taking off their family members. Here are fathers, man. I know now I'm, I'm in a position to look at this in judging cases inside the nation. And I'm telling you that there are young men that came and confessed to me that their father raped them. Mm -hmm. Now, hell, the boy ain't trying to be naked around his father, but hell, if a little boy can't change around his dad without the father thinking crazy. My daughter is a nurse and she saw a baby brought in. A man had tried to put his penis in a baby mm. and split that baby mm. from her vagina all the way down to her anus and the baby died. Yeah. Something has to be done. We can't live like this. And in our world, the penalty for abusing women and children death. is death. Should be, absolutely. And unless we are willing at some point to kill those who rape our women, to kill those who destroy our children, that's going to come. Not now, because you got to be taught 
first and given a chance to reform your life, but you are not going to live among us and carry out that crap and not pay for it. We don't give a damn about this man's law. We have to have a law that we live by. That's the law of God. And I'm just telling, I mean, we're not clean enough to do that. We're not righteous enough to do that. But at some point, I hope we never will have to do that. But I have beautiful daughters that grew up in my house. I never saw my daughter's legs. When they were babies, yes, but as they matured, I never saw them. They came out of their bedroom. They had a garment on. They had a, 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 a house coat on. They couldn't go around their brothers in a manner that would inspire in a young man lust. You have to understand the nature of our creation. That's how life continues through procreation. So there's a natural thing in a man for a woman. And when he sees a woman disrobed, well, all I got to do is ask you this. How many spies are female? And how do they get the secrets of a government? They put a woman on that man. Because it's hard for a man to just walk away from a woman that's exposing herself and is desirous of having sex with you. That's hard. You let all your guard down. Well, some do. Yeah. And I've been tested by that. I have to tell you the truth. But God is my witness, man. I... So far, I've not yielded to that kind of temptation. I have too much respect for a woman and too much respect for myself. But I don't want to see our women abused. And when I talked about Beyonce, I don't talk about my sister in a negative way. I love her too much. But she's so fine. And God knows these men lust after her with the beauty of her form. And when a woman dances in a manner that is suggestive, that's what is in these peep shows. Men get off the highway and go into a peep show. Why do the peep show make money? They make money off of the nature of us. That's what Nixon was saying. Criminalize their passion. And we can fill the jails with them. So my dear sisters, you're beautiful. And I would just ask, I mean, if you look at our sisters, I mean, we're not trying to enslave them. They, after they know themselves and love themselves, they want to cover themselves. That's the nature of decency. Cover. You have enough time to uncover when you meet the right person. <laughs> now, now let me ask you a question. You, uh... I'm pro-choice and pro-life. I want a woman to think hard about the man she chooses to give herself to because you are too precious to give yourself away to somebody that ain't fit to be in a bed with you. Have no thought of responsibility. He just wants pleasure. And after the pleasure is taken, you are like a piece of toilet paper. He throws you away and finds somebody else. You deserve better than that. And you should demand better than that from any man. And when you give yourself to that man, that's pro-choice. I choose to lay down with this man because I love him. He's shown himself to me to be worthy of what I have to give him. And then we pray that when you're pregnant, he won't run away from you. And, you know, sometimes these brothers, once you tell them you're pregnant, you don't hardly want to see them anymore. Not that you don't want to mm -hmm. see them. They don't want to see you. Right. They come back, what? Pregnant? 
Do you know what you should do? You should get rid of it. Now, i close that point with this. Brothers, look. We talk about white police shooting black men, real. We talk about us killing each other, real. Have you ever checked out the statistics of how many abortions go through the black community in a year? Not just some, millions of unborn life life that could answer the prayers that we have sent up to God. The answer is coming through the womb of a woman. You are sacred. Your womb is sacred. And that channel that leads to the womb, there's a hymen there that tells you that you don't break that unless you're serious about what life is. The pain of breaking the hymen and the pain or the joy of sex leads to the pain of birth, which is equal to the pain of death. No, my dear sister, you're too precious. You are the glory of God for man. And we want to always honor, respect you, love you, and be willing to fight and die to protect your honor. That's the way we've been taught by Elijah Muhammad, and I think he was right. And as time goes on, you will see the reason why we are dying is and our women are being spared is because in war, it's the male of the opponent after the male that he's after, once he destroys the male, who's, uh, who gets the spoils of war? The winner. It's the one who wins. And why are you called booty? Why is your backside called your booty? Pirate booty. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. It's a treasure. God dog it. Shouldn't it be our treasure? She's our treasure. Why should we let any man come in and take our treasure, talk calling it booty? And why should we be that low down to do that ourselves? See, brother, I just have to say, that's why we are dying off. And they are taking our women. Right now, white men treat you better than a black man. You go and meet some white boys in school, the black man is talking junk. The white boy trying to talk sense. But in the sense that he's talking, he's talking to get up close to you because as a race, they are dying. And the only way they can live is to live through the womb of a black woman. You all don't know who you are. You don't know your power. You don't know the time that you're living in. And once you get that knowledge, then you can make a good decision for yourself, and I believe you'll choose wisely. I look at the freaks in Paris that design women's clothes. Shoot all the men wearing them now. What you say? <laughs> <laughs> Charlemagne. They, I couldn't put on one of them skinny suits. <laughs> I said, damn, what is that? It's all up here. The fly that used to be hidden by the length of a coat is all the way up here. Your behind is out as a man. Well, who's spotting that for you? Yeah, it's almost like if they can't kill us, they want to feminize us. Say it again, Charlemagne. That's exactly right. The black male is being feminized. Oh, I got to say one more thing on that. Have you seen these commercials? Um, if you take this um, this medicine and you find yourself developing breasts, stop <laughs> stop immediately. I think you went too far if you start growing yeah, breasts. Right. That's the point. <laughs> but it's a chemical reaction. Do you know? Look, look at this. Another medicine. 
They say if you take this and you have suicidal thoughts, mm -hmm. stop. You mean a pill with chemistry in it could make me as a sane man think insanity to kill myself? Well, what about the rise of homosexuality and lesbianism? Are, is that a natural phenomenon? Are we born that way? Or is it a chemical reaction that makes us susceptible to ideas like that? We got to think now because we're dealing with a scientist of evil that is called in the scripture Satan. And he's working on us, baby. And I'm just saying this on, on this wonderful TV show. I think if we check what we eat and check the pills that we use, we'll find out that some of us are absolutely being chemicalized as we are being feminized. Well, well, I, you, you speak about killing our kids. What was your reaction towards hearing that the gun used to kill Trayvon Martin was auctioned off by Zora Zimmerman for a quarter million dollars? Well, that's like the cross that Jesus was martyred on Somebody come along and sell a piece of it to somebody that loves Jesus? Why would I want a piece of the cross that you nail my Savior to? Why would I want to buy a gun that you use to kill my brother? But that shows you the hate that is in the world where you can offer a gun that killed a black man and offer it for $250,000? See? What about the gun that killed the nine in South Carolina? How much will we pay for that? See, people are insulting us every day. Man, I just say we're going to wake up, man. That man, what's his name? George Zimmerman. 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 There'll be a time coming soon where he won't even be able to walk near us. What are you saying, Farrakhan? I'm saying what I said. There'll be a time when those who kill us outside of the law of justice will be afraid. They have to look over their shoulder every day because the tribe is getting angry. The people want justice. And if you're not going to give us justice, we have to take justice. That's the thing that's coming. And if you don't want anarchy, if you don't want revolt, if you don't want revolution, then give the human being justice that is the joy of freedom. The people want justice. Now you speak about, you speak with a lot of celebrities, a lot of artists, a lot of entertainers. We talk about the bad stuff in our communities, but a lot of these artists are spewing this bad things in our community. And this is a community where some kids don't have fathers and they look at these artists as their fathers, as their inspirations, as people they want to be. Do you ever talk to these artists about cleaning up their music and being more positive and not talking about hoeing and drugs? Because and... you meet with a lot of artists. You know, yes. You meet with a lot of artists. When they sit down with me, I'm not their judge. Elijah Muhammad said to me, when I'm gone, brother, you may sit in my seat as the father over the house in my absence. I love my people. I live and I will die to see our people free. When I meet a rapper, I'm looking at the God within him that he has 5 million, 10 million followers. You don't magnetize 10 million followers unless you have a great gift. And that gift comes from only one source, he who gives the gift. That's God. But you're using your gift improperly. You're using your gift to feed, 
filth and degeneracy to your people. But all we need to do is sit with you and then turn your gift in the right direction and then you'll have five million followers that you teach and raise and make a difference in their lives. I was uh, in North Carolina yesterday and and Two Chains uh, was coming through and he wanted to sit with uh, Brother Farrakhan for a minute and we had at least 40 minutes together and, and those are some of the things we talked about. We talked about the number of followers that he has. Mm -hmm. And I said, brother, show me a pastor that can show you five million following him. I said, that puts on you a great responsibility to use your gift to elevate the consciousness of those who follow you. And he, of course, agreed. And I asked him, are you working on a new album? Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, yes, he is. And we talked about what will come out in his next album. And, you know, he has a very beautiful mother. And his mother, I hope you won't be disturbed with me too, as I'm saying something private that you and I spoke of, but mom is going through something with cataracts. And a son that loves his mother and is watching his mother suffer through something. Every rapper, look at Kanye, his beautiful mother. She came to my home in Chicago. She's a great educator. And she made a son that's more than just a rapper. Kanye, like you, they asked you, I think you were on somebody's show, and they asked you about, why, why you say you are God? Oh, on Stephen Colbert's show. Yeah. yeah. What intrigued Colbert? It would have been all right if you said, Charlemagne the devil? <laughs> he wouldn't even ask you a question yeah. about that because it's easy to be against the nature of yourself, the way he's made you. It's hard to now be the God that you know you are. So you gave him a hell of an answer, brother, mm -hmm. when you told him, yeah, I, I mean, it's a challenge, but I accept that challenge. Mm -hmm. In other words, you've given yourself something to live up to because you are a God. Kanye's a God. DJ's a God. Angela is a God. I thought God was all male. No, 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 no. How could we be God and you not be when you produced us? Tell us. Mm. See, when you understand this woman and our relationship to her, so he's going he's gonna to write some stuff about mom, about life, about, but he's going to have to put a little spice in it too. I can't get holy overnight, man. This is real. You gotta hit him with something that, oh yeah, okay, I'm, I'm all right. But here, check this one out. I heard you give Kendrick props because you said you feel like it's a, you feel like it's a rise in black consciousness in, in the music. Yes, I've never met brother, but I see him as a very great thinker. He's very conscious. His lyrics are tremendous. And the beat. Look, this is the genius of us. We got the whole world, brother, in our hands. You go to China, the Chinese youth got their pants <laughs> dropping and fixing their hair. <laughs> Strange, and they know all the rap. All you got to do is just twist it a little. Satan grabbed rap that came out of the Bronx. That was consciousness. Public Enemy, KRS-One, Big Daddy Kane. They were teaching. White folks saw that. 
This is against our plan. If they continue like that, these little Negroes will be up and thinking and dangerous for us. Let's see if we can turn it. Well, they come up out of the ghetto. They usually use drugs, sold drugs, wear guns, get in gang fights. Let's see if we can get them to talk about that life and let's promote it and make them rich. See, you don't see the people behind the scenes plotting, but that's the plot. Did I tell you the last time I was here that there was a meeting that I heard of in California where prison executives met with record executives mm -hmm. and they talked about prisons being on the um, stock, stock market, market mm -hmm. and they wanted to increase uh, the, the, um, the people that were coming to prison and they felt that using the records, labels, and the promoting of beefs through the record label Right now in Chicago is a beef between Little Dirk and King Louie, and, and each of them have 500,000, 600,000 followers. So when you start promoting a beef and nobody wants to help clean it up, I didn't, I didn't like to see uh, um, the brother that came up in the studio. Birdman? Birdman. 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 Mm -hmm. He's a great giant. You know, I don't want to see him beefing with you because the two of you, if we settle it, we bring peace because you got millions following you. He got millions following him. So when the beef is on, his folk, I'm with that. We got to do this. And we push up on each other, man. That ain't why. I'm hoping that, that my brother will squash all these beefs, man, so we can have some peace and get to the real enemy, which is not each other. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I just got two more questions. One, you know, when you spoke on uh, about your experience on the will, people called you crazy. But now Hillary Clinton is saying that she promises to reveal the truth about UFOs if she becomes president. What do you think about that? <laughs> Yeah, Jimmy Carter said the same thing. He saw the wheels, and he said when he became president, he was going to open it up. When Eisenhower was president, he sent somebody out there and uh, to um, Nevada to see what that was about, and they told Eisenhower, that they were not going to open that up for him. He said, you're going to open it up for me. He'll bring the first army and take it over. He threatened them. There's something real in Area 51. Hillary Clinton knows about it. She's um, been exposed. Um, one of the um, a Jewish men... I can't remember his name right now, but he befriended her. It's a Rockefeller. Yeah, it's a Rockefeller. And he became friends with the Clintons and opened up his file on UFOs to Mr. and Mrs. Clinton. They've been knowing about it. President Obama was giving out awards one day and he said he was the first president to openly talk about Area 51 uh, that this woman who he was giving an award to has been championing, letting the American people know the reality of what's above our heads. And so Farrakhan has been taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad about these things they're very, very real. I've had an experience with the wheel. I know what I'm talking about. And that's why I'm so bold. Brothers and sisters, 
You know, I don't talk God. I'm backed by God. And I mean, if if you want to kill me, I can't stop you. Help yourself. But you'll die right afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. No, I'm I'm serious. I know. God will take America down in 12 hours by the clock. You have no power with the God I serve. See if you can stop the tornadoes. They're coming more and more. they like women dancing in long skirts. Check that out. Rain coming like you've never seen it before. All of a sudden, a flash flood and people, you see the cars going down underwater. Stop it if you can. You got hail coming out of the sky the size of of uh, baseball. And soon, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, you see them coming out of the sky like blocks of ice. You got fire going on north of our border in Canada. 1,600 and some odd square miles burning. They've never seen a fire like that. Stop that. You're dealing with a God and the forces of nature. I mean, uh, Obama and all the scientists of war here, you can't stop that. So let me, let me, let me see if I can wrap this up. Do you have another question, Ms. Yee? Oh, no, I think we got We got to yeah, close this out. Our yeah. cameraman is out of, almost out of time, a... and we have to leave with a prayer. Okay, well, I want to close this with a prayer. But my prayer is a little different. <laughs> Look, neither Bernie Sanders, Hillary, or Trump can stop the wrath of God that is coming down on America. After this broadcast, the weather will intensify. I'm not before you of myself. I'm a warner from God to America and the nations of the earth by God's permission. God is destroying America by degrees with the forces of nature which you have no power against. Mr. Sanders, you are Jewish. And you have studied the Torah, I know you know, about Passover, where God and the angel of death passed over those children of Israel that had an X on their gatepost made with the blood of a lamb. All of that is pointing to today. The death angel is in America as we speak. These natural disasters are going to increase. Hillary can't stop it. Sanders can't stop it. Trump can't stop it. But you can do something that will cause God to give America longer time to exist as a nation, I'm not crazy. I'm not a man that hates this country in which I was born. I want to see you get past what you are facing. America is facing that which will destroy her as a nation and break her power completely. You'll never make America great again Mr. Trump, but you can extend her time. Mm. What can you do? Mr. Sanders, as a Jewish man, what could Pharaoh do to extend his time and stop the plagues from coming on Egypt? This is the modern Egypt, Mr. Sanders. Let the black man go and give us justice. And these things that are whipping you today will start diminishing. 
and you will get a longer period of time. But you and what you have for the American people, you will never stop what God is bringing down on America. Hillary, you're a strong woman. You're an intelligent woman. You're not a good woman. But if you want to do good, let the black man go and stop deceiving them that you are really their friend. If you were their friend, why did you kill Gaddafi? Why did you destroy Libya and then create the problem of refugees running out of North Africa into Europe? That's your doing, Miss Clinton. If you love black people, why are you destroying Haiti? If you love black people, why did you, Mr. Clinton, stop them from the rice that they were producing in Haiti to feed themselves and other Caribbean nations? And you put the rice out of business and now rice is coming from Arkansas, chicken coming from Arkansas when it once was growing right there in Haiti. You got to take responsibility for the hell that you've been uh, giving to our people, not only in America, but in Haiti and the Caribbean, and now in Africa. Mrs. Clinton, your hand is bloody. What will you do? You want to escape it, let the black man go. Stop lying to us that you love us. And if you really love us, let us go and give us some of this territory that we can call our own and give us the billions of dollars that we can get started with land and with tractors and the things that would make us an independent nation. You could do that if you would. You don't have a lot of time. And if you think I'm crazy, keep going the way you're going and watch what God does. That's the way I'd like to close my time on this wonderful breakfast club. Yes, sir. Eat that and get full. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the Honorable Thank Minister you Louis for listening. Thank, Thank you, you for coming much. on, brother. All right. Just talked to Fair Con that sensei nigga told him I've been on tears since the 10th grade nigga got a middle finger. Hey ladies, I need to put you on to my new hair secret. Have you heard of frontal closures? If you wear weaves or extensions, then these are a must to protect your edges, your natural hair. Save your edges, right? That's right. It's a frontal where you're able to cover your hair from ear to ear. You can go from blonde to black in a matter of seconds. Now her imports has Swiss lace frontal closures with custom hairlines and make your hair look flawless without the need to ruin your natural hair. Her imports has them in all their stores and you can get them on herimports.com, of course. They also have videos to show you how to use them, so check them out today. Hey, 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 hey. The Breakfast Club, every weekday morning, tune in.